<clears throat> Hi, everyone. My name is Jesse Randall. I'm the founder and CEO of Sweater, and I'm excited to be hosting you today for Founder Saga. You know, our whole purpose, if you haven't ever seen these before, is to really dive in on the earliest stages of what it takes to get a business truly from the back of a napkin idea all the way up to a sustainable position. And there's tons of paths to take to get there. And what we really want to do is showcase what those paths are life, what they're like through the eyes of entrepreneurs that have actually done it. So today I'm really excited to have Brian, Brian here with us uh, to be able to walk through everything that you've been building uh, for the last few years. So Brian, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh yeah, no, this is great. So usually the way I like to start this out, Brian, is to begin by just talking about how like really um, like the quick pitch on yourself and the, the quick pitch of the company. And like, if you were talking to an investor today, what would you say in the quick two minutes? So everyone kind of knows yeah. where you're at, right? Yeah, no, it's sort of relevant right now because we're, we're, we're meeting with some VCs. So, so yeah, the, the major thing here is we have a thermal management system that's 300% more efficient than any system out there. And for aerospace, that matters quite a bit. So aerospace and space, um, it's well, quite a bit smaller, saves quite a bit of weight and performs at a higher level. Than anything else on the market so it's given us a lot of attention and we're just trying to at this point in time just scale the company yeah that's awesome okay so for all of us non-aerospace folks i think you need to tell us more about what that means yeah so, so give, give us a little bit more context yeah so i think one thing people can uh relate to is like computers right so if you have a if you have a desktop computer um it most likely has a fan and the fan is used to keep the electronics cool uh, something like kind of a, um, an interesting time to be alive. We are, we are producing, a, um, you know, new innovation never been seen before in the history of the world. And a lot of it has to do with electronics. So the more electronics you pack into a small area, the more heat it creates. Um, mm -hmm. And heat is a problem. Heat destroys things. So when you think about like engines that can go further or faster or space travel or a whole host of different things. Um, a lot of it's being driven by more powerful computers and those computers are on board creating a ton of heat. And so we have to be able to disperse that heat. And so that's what our whole company does. Uh, that's what we were founded to do is just to take like modern age technology that's being implemented on aircraft and on spacecrafts and get rid of the heat so that they can go farther and do more. Yeah. Okay. That's amazing. So why don't you just provide um, a little bit more insight into how it currently works and what's different about how you guys are approaching it, you know, whatever you're able to talk about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we have um, like proprietary ways of exchanging heat. So heat exchangers have been around for a long time, but the traditional like equipment that they use is just, it's outdated. So it's just not very efficient. So we've come up with uh, new ways of doing that. Um, and, um, it, one of the things I can I can share. So um, the way we did it is completely clean sheet. So it's a different way of approaching it from a, an engineering perspective. Um, so that's that's one thing. It's the most efficient heat exchanger in the world. Um, it just does a ton of stuff. So that's that's a really big thing. The second thing is um, we have like oil a scroll compressors that they're really efficient compressors that are small. Um, we have uh, smart technology that's implemented all over our system. So. Our systems do like push um, information. They don't just run. Uh, a lot of the legacy systems that you find on aircraft, they just run consistently. They're not variable. So ours varies based on what's actually needed. And um, and we have our own software code on it as well. So those are some of the things, the key, the key technologies that we have. But we own all the IP. Um, we spend a lot of time developing it. And, um, and it's given us a system design that's just uh, completely different than anything else out there. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Um, so, A, that sounds incredibly complicated. Um, <laughs> it's so, <laughs> yeah, it's like deep, deep tech. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, that's great. So, can you give us any clue kind of where you're at today? So, I mean, you're in market, right? I mean, you're selling this product. Uh -huh. um, what kind of indicator can you give us for like your reach or, or where you're at right now? Yeah. So, we are just barely reaching. Um, this um, technology relevance where we're actually in the field. So aerospace has a, a traditionally very long runway. So no pun mm -hmm. intended. That's that's just the way it is to get product to market. It takes a long time. So if you think about it, like somebody has an aerospace platform, you've got to convince them to allow you to put your thing on their platform. Um, and um, and that's a heady proposition. So you if you don't mm -hmm. have the pedigree tied to what you need to have there to be able to, to do that, you've got to convince someone to do that. So 
we've done that in a relatively short amount of time. Um, our company was founded in 2016 and we're going to market right now. So uh, we've won several new designs with no marketing, no advertising. It's just been word of mouth to this point. But the companies we're selling to are the biggest um, original equipment manufacturers in the world. So um, these are all the defense tier one companies, this commercial space companies, um, commercial aerospace companies. So very, very big companies are interested in what we're doing. So, yeah, well, and that's awesome. I mean, even to get in the door to even have yeah, a conversation yeah. is incredible. Well, and especially, I mean, I, so I mostly work in the world of software, right? I mean, in oh. software, you know, you can, there's less at risk, uh, I would assume, right? Than what you're doing. Yeah. So to actually have a physical product that you're getting in with top OEM manufacturers is incredible. I mean, you really have to prove your muster, right? You do. Yeah. It's, it's got to have reliability metric, all, all sorts of stuff that you have to have to be able to get in with those guys. But um, yeah, the physical product side, though, on the mechanical side, um, you're always looking at different failures and what could possibly happen, right? Like, what are all your risks that could that could come into play? Um, mm -hmm. And um, you're competing against companies that have been around a long time. So you've got to make sure it's reliable. That's for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. So give us the quick background on your background and kind of what led you towards this. We'll talk about like where the idea came from in a minute, so you don't need yeah. to go there yet, but just like your background, what led you towards wanting to do something? Yeah, so I I, um, I grew up in a family that owned, um, uh, still owns a company called Ram Company. It's an aerospace components company, 100% uh, privately held by my family. Um, and we do custom valves and actuation components for mostly um, mm -hmm. aviation and space platforms. Um, so that's the way I grew up. When I graduated from high school, that company sort of hit an inflection point where um, it had the pedigree. It took like 25 years to gain this pedigree. Um, but after it did, it was like the opportunities just started flowing in. And so my whole, after I got out of school, out of high school, I went to college um, and I got a degree. I, went, I started out in mechanical engineering, but then I went into business management and um, ended up getting an MBA. And then um, the family asked if I could come back and, and, and spend some time in the company because the business side of the company wasn't, um, wasn't as developed. The, the technical mm. side was very developed. Um, and so I decided to do that. Uh, I was getting married at the time. My wife and I decided, hey, let's take this as an opportunity. So we did. And then I just sort of for the next 12, 13 years, just, just learned the industry really well. So got to mm -hmm. know it, um, you know, worked on quite a few contracts, did all the contract negotiation, worked my way up to vice president of business development, um, helped to triple sales um, at our family company. And, um, and that's, Amazing. that's really what led me up into being able to understand what, what this was and how this industry works. Yeah. So you didn't wander off the street. That's the short story. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that's great. So why don't we jump back in time and, um, get a feel for what this original idea really was and, and how it manifested. I mean, I, I call it the back of the napkin. Yeah. You know, I mean, every, every, you know, offering ends up as, you know, at least initially starts as an idea in something, maybe not on a napkin, but where, where did this stem from? Where did the opportunity arise? How did you connect the dots? So I actually met a guy who was running, um, he was he was doing a management for General Electric um, on a project like in 2008. And um, we ended up hitting it off. That project didn't go anywhere, but I, I got to know him better. And then several years later, we just kind of kept in contact um, he was working for a different company with some engineers and they saw this as an opportunity. They're like, thermal management has not moved enough. There's not enough innovation there. There's a lot of opportunity. Um, it's sort of like this club that you have to get into, very monopolistic, high barriers to entry. But once you're there, they don't have real incentive to innovate. So they're just taking the same stuff that they developed in the 60s and 70s and they're just freshing it up and refreshing it and putting it on aircraft. So um, they called me because they wanted to see if we could manufacture the system for them because in aerospace, you also have to have certified manufacturing facilities and all that kind of stuff, which we had uh, with our family company. And, um, and we just started getting into it. At this point, it was just a, it was a schematic. It was an idea. There wasn't a physical product yet, uh, but I flew to Texas and I met with them. And, um, and just from that point on, we were, I was involved in the, the, the whole, you know, the, the company, so. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. So, I mean, in that regard, is this a joint venture or anything or like? No, they, so they started the company um, and initially um, we were involved as a manufacturer, but then as time progressed, so that was in 2016 and 2018, we became investors. 
So we invested and started, um, we did have input in how the company was being led and guided and all those sorts of things. Um, but then in, in 2019, I went to our board and said, let's, let's go ahead and, and uh, secure majority share of the company. Um, gotcha. We came up with a business plan. Um, we executed on that plan to get the company, uh, to, to buy the company essentially. Um, and then the board of that company, independent board, voted me in as the CEO for orchestrating that deal. And uh, that's sort of how that happened. And from there, from that point, the company really didn't have much business. Um, we've sort of taken off from there. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, then let's, why don't we dive into kind of what the early days looked like? I mean, uh, I, I think from the, the time that you stepped in, right? So what, would, what existed at the time that you actually stepped into this? So I'll go off of 2019 because that's that's going to be more relevant, I think, to our conversation. Um, at that point in time, they had had they had some contracts for some design work. They really didn't have a product that they were building yet, um, and the company was under a tremendous amount of financial strain. So you had like a situation where um, you've got you know hundreds of thousands of dollars of inventory that you need, and hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars of, of analysis. Um, you've got outside companies working on a bunch of this stuff. It's just a tremendous amount, right? You're developing code from scratch. You're developing a controller from scratch, a pump from scratch. It's all this, all this stuff that you need um, is completely, it's not available. So um, when we got involved, um, there was only four employees from the legacy, from the original group that were there. And, and so I came in as a CEO and I took one of my guys from RAM who worked for me and he quit RAM and came over and worked for me. And, um, and we went up there and we just moved the company down to St. George, Utah from Port Angeles, Washington. So we moved it down and it, and it really didn't have much going on. I mean, it had a couple of contracts and the military was interested, but they wanted to see if we could actually build what we said we, you know, all this analysis that we produced said we could. So mm -hmm. what we really focused on was we need to build the product. So we got with the engineering team, um, we built the product, we invited the military in, they came in and watched it, it performed exactly how it was supposed to. And from there we got full funding and and um, and then it just sort of like rolled on from there. So it was quite a bit of, quite a bit of stuff. Okay, so I feel like you glossed over that part, <laughs> that it, it just worked the way it was supposed to. Yeah. I think there's a lot more to that. <laughs> there was a lot of sleepless nights, yeah, for sure. So my my wife was pregnant with, with our fourth baby and um, and I decided, hey, I want to quit my job and do this acquisition. <laughs> and she was like, what? Yeah. Um, and you really don't know how that's going to go, right? I mean, it was the company was under a tremendous amount of financial distress. That's part of the reason why we made the acquisition play. If the company was more mature, we couldn't have afforded it. Um, so we had to do a correct amount of analysis to understand, can we save this company? And is it, does it have a product that's worth you know, getting involved with? Um, so mm -hmm. that, that time from about May of 2019 until October of 2019 of just like diving in and, um, and explaining to my family, Hey, I've got to go all in on this. I can't just like dip my toe in it. Um, the board of directors has asked me to be the CEO. Um, I have responsibility to them, to the employees, to the investors. There's quite a few investors at the time. Um, and so it was really getting in and then, and then looking at contracts, supplier relationships, there was all sorts of stuff that just had to be torn down and built back up. And, um, and I told the guys, I want to do that the right way. I don't want to take shortcuts. I don't want to, you know, screw anybody over in any way. Um, so any yeah. supplier who hasn't been paid, we need to pay them. So we had money we were working with. We flew through that money pretty quickly, just getting the company right. Um, but then when it was right, it was like, okay, now, now we can build it back up and we can take the time that we need to, to do that. But we really didn't end up having very much time. So, um, after we proved out the product that it worked, uh, we had two different system designs that we kicked off in prototype phase. We built both of them, delivered them on time. They tested out exactly how they were supposed to. So that part of, of everything and not to gloss over it, that was an extremely stressful time because you're, you have this, these systems that are, you know, a half a million dollars each and you don't have any money um, and you're trying to make them work because if you can make them work, there's plenty of money, but if you can't, then you don't have the money to fix them. So yeah. um, we just, we, we were just, yeah, yeah. one shot in the barrel, right? Yeah. yeah. <sighs> So anyway, we, we got them to work, uh, delivered them on time. And then, um, and then from there, it's just been straight up. It's been exponential growth.
So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So I mean, let's talk more about what it takes to actually get a product like this built. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, what did your team look like? Um, <clears throat> when you organize that kind of thing, I mean, you're not able to do everything internally. So you already mentioned you had lots of suppliers surrounding you. Yeah. So let's dive more into like the technical side of actually getting that built, you know, from your perspective as the CEO pushing resources into this, uh -huh. um, give us some more detail there. Yeah. So, so the hardest part is just not having enough people, right? This is the common refrain from um, the engineering group was we don't have enough people. Um, and so you're, it's, it's a double edged sword there. You want to go out, you want to hire as many people as you can. Um, but one of the things I think that's unique about us is we're trying to do this like massive jump into aerospace, like through like retained earnings. So we're not taking outside investment at this point. Um, and so we're really being judicious about how we use our money and our resources and not just hiring as many people as we as we think we need. Um, so that was initially how it went. It was kind of um, kind of stressful. We had weeks where guys were here for over 100 hours. I mean, just like some of the stuff that you hear about startups, that's really great, you know, anecdotal kind of stuff, but it's, it's also really stressful at the time. So, you know, we've got pictures of guys just at like three, four in the morning. They're like, I can't do it anymore. And they just crash on the floor. Um, and at the same time, you're looking around at, at these people and you're like, wow, like this, this kind of dedication, I haven't seen anywhere else. Like, it's just insane to watch people put in, you know, 110 um, hours in a week, 120 hours in a week to try and get this thing to work. Um, mm -hmm. and so the resource side was, was difficult, but once, once you did, once we did have capital free up or, or money free up from, um, from business performance, then it was like, okay, let's go out and hire the people that we need. And so we've been hiring pretty steady ever since then, but managing those resources is tough. Um, everybody's wearing different hats. It's just, you know, lift where you stand. It's all you can do. Yeah, exactly. Um, so throughout that, that product creation process clearly there's a lot of stress with that knowing that you've got one in the chamber so to speak yeah, yeah. so um was there any point when you wondered whether or not this was actually going to work oh yeah <laughs> i think all of this i mean you have faith in it you have faith in your team you have faith in the people that you're working with um, and that never wavered but it's it's also it comes down to it's at a at some point it's like um, I have faith that we can figure this out. We just, we're running out of money. So it, it comes down to like, we have to perform at a certain point. Um, but there's definitely quite a few nights where it's like, it's like a, you know, <laughs> it's like being in a bad relationship. It's like some days you're super excited and some days you're, you're just shot down. <laughs> like it's, it's up and down all the time, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so tell me more about your team. I mean, yeah. you're the CEO, who else is in on the, you know, the top levels driving the, the strategy and the vision for this? And, and how did you come together? So that's a good question. Um, we've really taken, um, well, there's this old, you know, sort of axiom in, in engineering that, that a really good engineer is worth, you know, a thousand mediocre engineers, or there's different, different versions of that. But that's the, the approach that we've taken the whole time is let's hire the best talent that we can. So whether that's on the business side, the technical side, um, we want to go out and we want to find these people that really have a ton of talent. And so our leadership team is made up of um, uh, Nick Kaiser. He's our VP of engineering and he's just brilliant. One of the best systems engineers, thermal engineers you could possibly have on your team. VP of programs is uh, Taylor Fawcett. He's a um, legacy aerospace guy, um, really understands like what, what it takes to have a program work. Um, but just really, really talented people. Um, Kevin Curland, our VP of Ops, and, and um, he's run his own company. He's gone through just a, a crazy amount of experience that's been very, very helpful to us getting to where we're supposed to be. And then Brad Plotho is our, our VP of Strategy, and Brad's got a, a resume in Silicon Valley of uh, marketing and strategy that's just it's really, really impressive. So that's sort of our leadership mm -hmm. core. Um, and then from there, we've gone out and just – headhunted the best engineering we can in thermal and and mechanical and electrical uh, software engineering um, so it's been it's been really cool yeah that's that's awesome so let's touch on your your initial revenue so <clears throat> you got funding from it sounds like company resources uh, right in order to come at it and get the prototype built right i mean i guess it's probably more than a prototype it sounds like um, but you said that the Department of Defense was watching you go through this? Yeah, specifically the, right? the branches of the military were because 
um, it's really high performance equipment. Um, and it might not sound like it's, it's all that special, but the benefit of it is, is like, if you look at like, um, it's a constraining problem, the heat barrier. So, um, hypersonic flight, supersonic flight, electric flight, laser weapons, space travel, like any kind of meaningful space travel, interstellar space travel, um, going really, really fast to get to a destination, right? Everyone like likes the idea of being able to take a flight from like Las Vegas to London and having it last three hours. Um, that's possible if you can if you can understand what heat is doing to your systems. It's not the only constraining problem, but it's a major one. And so the military is mm -hmm. looking at what we're doing. They're like, well, geez, if you guys if you can really do that now, we now laser weapons on aircraft are viable. That's it's like Star Wars. It's like you can put lasers on fighter jets and have them fight with lasers. There's a, it's powerful enough to do that. Um, like a laser, you can imagine it has so much heat that's being generated that you fire it one time and it destroys the whole system. But you can deal mm -hmm. with that heat like effectively and efficiently. Now you can build that system. And, and so the military was really um, curious about what we were doing. And um, so you had like the Navy, the Army, really paying close attention to that. Um, and then once we proved it out, mm -hmm. they, they were pretty excited. So. Yeah, I bet they were. <laughs> I mean, you know, along with Space Force, they can also launch the yeah, X-Wing yeah, yeah, yeah. and do it simultaneously, yeah. right? <laughs> we got some X-Wings in our military arsenal, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, so when it comes to like, I mean, they're sort of looking over your shoulder that mm -hmm. whole time, you know, waiting to see whether or not you can actually build what you said you could. Um, it sounds like that was in 2019. Uh -huh. So it took you know, a year, year and a half, you know, to actually go through and get that thing built. Did they like, did they hold any carrots out in front of you? I mean, it's kind of implied, but was there anything like specific that they're like, you know, if you can actually do this, then you have X, Y, Z opportunities, or was it still like a pretty big, um, no, for sure. There was, um, I'm a little bit limited in what I can say there just because these, these programs are, are, you know, some of them have top secret, um, credentials behind them, but but there for sure was opportunity there tied to it. Um, just just the way that the military is moving in general and, and um, the commercial aerospace world as well, everybody wants to be more efficient and use less fuel, right? Um, and everybody wants to get more performance out of their systems. And so um, so there was some major contracts tied to, to performing. So it wasn't like we were we were bottom of the barrel trying to, to, to scrape our way up to the top at that point. It was more like, we were we're at the bottom of the cash barrel, I guess, and we need to figure out a way to to build the system because if at this point after five years it has to I mean, or I guess at that point it was three years, we've got to prove out that we can actually do what we say we can do, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, that's that's super interesting to think about those dynamics. So you're going to be manufacturing in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, in St. George? Yeah, or, in St. George. So or... we're we're a systems integrator, which is a bit different. Um, you know, you think about a traditional manufacturing plant. That's more like you know machinery, heavy machinery, things like that. With us, what we're doing is we're bringing in. Um, even though we own the IP, we're having you know the individual components um, usually manufactured somewhere else. And then we're bringing those in and having mechanical engineers basically put this model system together. So a big program for us, say 100 systems a year. Um, these systems, like I mentioned before, about a half a million dollars each. Um, so, so when you get to that level where you're where you're doing that kind of business, um, it, it makes sense for us to make sure that these like highly tuned performance machines are are accurately you know calibrated. So. We actually have um, mm -hmm. mechanical engineers who work on these and make sure that they're put together correctly. It's not like we have technicians doing it, um, but for the most part, it's not so much manufacturing as it is like model building. That's the best way. There's not a lot of mm -hmm. efficiencies to be gained when you're doing like, you know, one system at a time and you're doing, you know, 50 or 100 a year. Right. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Um, so like when it comes to marketing, I mean, you said that it's mostly been word of mouth, like when it comes to sales and uh -huh. that sort of thing, At this point. um, I mean, yeah, well, I mean, it sounds like you've got more on your plate than you can, you know, I mean, you got a lot in the pipeline. How about yeah, that? we do. We've, we've had, it's funny because we haven't done any kind of, um, marketing yet, really. I mean, we're getting ready to change our name. So the company's name has been airborne environmental control systems, and we're changing it to intergalactic, which is a, it's a big swing for aerospace. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but it's all deliberate for us. I mean, part of it is we want people to understand like our product is game changing. We want our name to match that, right? Um, so mm-hmm. we're we're setting ourselves up for a pretty big um, marketing like launch off this new brand that we're doing. Um, but we've had all these companies calling us saying, hey, we heard about you guys from different engineers. The aerospace, I guess, world is tight. So whenever there's a new innovation, it kind of passes its way around. And pretty soon you have all these big companies calling and asking about it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's a great place to be. Keep that cost of acquisition yeah, down. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I would usually like to give like the last five minutes just back to you and like hand you an open mic and you know Im- imagine yourself standing in front of an auditorium of you know three hundred entrepreneurs that are looking at this and you know what would you tell them to you know help them get through it and make it through the mm-hmm. other side to where they find success? What would you want them to know? Uh, I think that the biggest thing is that you just have to like all the all the analysis that you do right like there's no we were talking about this this morning in, in a company meeting that we were having. Um, you know, now we're to a point where we've got around 30 people, mostly engineers, and we're hiring as fast as we can, and we're getting ready to go out and look for VC money and all this stuff. And it's a different place to be. Um, but when you're when you're in, in the beginning of it and you're analyzing everything, there's just no guarantees. And so the best thing you can do is really put your mind into what you're doing do all that analysis. And then at the end of the day, like, how do you feel inside? Like, do you feel like it's a good, good way to go or not? Um, it doesn't mean you'll be successful. You could still fail, but whatever you learn from failure, um, can be applied to whatever you do next. And so failure shouldn't scare anybody. I mean, I think it's interesting. I was reading this book on Silicon Valley, uh, five or six years ago. And one of the things it talked about was this ethos of like in old school wall street. So think of like Gordon Gecko, like 1980s wall street, um, you know, like the junk bond craze, all that kind of stuff. The, at that time, if you failed, if you lost a billion dollars, it was like just pin the scar- scarlet letter on your shirt and, and you're done. Like nobody else is going to touch you. Um, it was like a big ego play. It was like you, you just, you, you lost a billion dollars. There's no way. But Silicon Valley doesn't see it that way. So in Silicon Valley, um, it's almost like something you want to put on your resume. Like I lost a billion dollars because there's just things you can't learn unless you go through those experiences. So um, like I mentioned, Kevin Curlin having prior company experience, he took a company through bankruptcy. I mean, I I looked at that not as a black eye, but as experience I don't have. Um, When you're trying to do a tech startup, like that's a, that's a reality that you, that you have to understand is like this, that it could go bankrupt in the early days. And luckily we're past that now, but he had like um, he had the guts for it. You know, and so not every failure is not a bad thing. You can't not do something that you think is a good idea because you're afraid of failure. Um, but you, you, it, it should it should be something that you can you learn from and, and you can drive into the next thing. So regardless, one way or the other, like if, if you do that analysis and you feel good about it, just go for it, you know, and, and, um, mm. and put everything you have into it. But you can't dip your toe into it. You really have to jump in. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I've always used the analogy. It's like jumping into icy water, right? You just got to get yeah. used to the temperature. It's true. You'll be fine. Yeah, we, we, uh, we, you know, we get used to it. So we acclimate over time. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Brian, thank you for spending some time with us today. Yeah. You know, um, what you're building, I'm just going to call it intergalactic Absolutely. if you don't mind. Yeah. You know, I mean, what, what you're building is fantastic. And I'm excited to see the impact you have on the world. And I can't wait to take that flight from Las Vegas to London in three hours. I think that sounds fantastic. Yeah, one of these days we're going to get there. So. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thanks Thank so you. much. Talk to you later.